Volume One, Letters Nineteen through Twenty Four of the History of Emily Montague. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of Emily Montague, Volume One, by Francis Moore Brooke. Letters Nineteen through Twenty Four, read by Capricia Page as Emily Montague. Amanda Friday as Arabella Fermor, Kit Nusis as Edward Rivers. Letter nineteen to Miss Fermor at Saliri, Montreal, September twenty fourth. I have but a moment, my dear, to acknowledge your last. This week has been a continual hurry. You mistake me. It is not the romantic passion of fifteen that I wish to feel but that tender lively friendship which alone can give charms to so intimate a union as that of marriage i wish a greater conformity in our characters in our sentiments in our tastes but i will say no more on this subject till i have the pleasure of seeing you at saliri mrs melmoth and i come in a ship which sails in a day or two they tell us it is the most agreeable way of coming colonel rivers is so polite as to stay to accompany us down Major Melmoth asked Sir George, but he preferred the pleasure of parading into Quebec, and showing his fine horses and fine person to advantage, to that of attending to his mistress. Shall I own to you that I am hurting at this instance of his neglect, as I know his attendance on the general was not expected? His situation was more than a sufficient excuse. It was highly improper for two women to go to Quebec alone it is in some degree so that any other man should accompany me at this time my pride is extremely wounded i expect a thousand times more attention from him since his acquisition of fortune it is with pain i tell you this my dear friend he seems to show me much less i will not descend to suppose he presumes on this increase of fortune but he presumes on the inclination he supposes i have for him an inclination, however, not violent enough to make me submit to the least ill-treatment from him. In my present state of mind, I am extremely hard to please. Either his behaviour or my temper have suffered a change. I know not how it is, but I see his faults in a much stronger light than I have ever seen them before. I am alarmed at the coldness of his disposition, so ill-suited to the sensibility of mine. I begin to doubt his being of the amiable character I once supposed. In short, I begin to doubt of the possibility of his making me happy. You will, perhaps, call it an excess of pride when I say I am much less inclined to marry him than when our situations were equal. I certainly love him. I had a habit of considering him as the man I am to marry. But my affection is not of that kind— which will make me easy under the sense of an obligation. I will open all my heart to you when we meet. I am not so happy as you imagine. Do not accuse me of caprice. Can I be too cautious, or the happiness of my whole life is at stake? Adieu, your faithful, Emily Montague. Letter 20 To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, September 24 i declare off at once i will not be a squaw i admire their talking of the liberty of savages in the most essential point they are slaves the mothers marry their children without ever consulting their inclinations and they are obliged to submit to this foolish tyranny dear england where liberty appears not as here among these odious savages wild and ferocious like themselves but lovely smiling led by the hand of the graces there is no true freedom anywhere else. They may talk of the privilege of choosing a chief, but what is that to the dear English privilege of choosing a husband? I have been at an Indian wedding, and have no patience, nor did I see so vile an assortment. Adieu, I shall not be in good humour this month. Yours, A. Fermor. Letter 21. To John Temple, Esquire, Pall Mall, Montreal, September 24th. What you say, my dear friend, is more true than I wish it was. Our English women of character are generally too reserved, 
Their manner is cold and forbidding. They seem to think it a crime to be too attractive. They appear almost afraid to please. Tis to this ill-judged reserve I attribute the low profligacy of too many of our young men. The grave faces and distant behaviour of the generality of virtuous women fright them from their acquaintance, and drive them into the society of those wretched votaries of vice, whose conversation debases every sentiment of their souls. With as much beauty, good sense, sensibility, and softness, at least, as any woman on earth, no women please so little as the English, depending on their native charms, and on those really amiable qualities which envy cannot deny them. They are too careless in acquiring those enchanting nameless graces, which no language can define, which give resistless force to beauty, and even supply its place where it is wanting. They are satisfied with being good, without considering that unadorned virtue may command esteem, but will never excite love, and both are necessary in marriage, which are supposed to be the state every woman of honour has in prospect, for I own myself rather incredulous as to the assertions of maiden aunts and cousins to the contrary. I wish my amiable countrywoman would consider one moment that virtue is never so lovely as when dressed in smiles. The virtue of women should have all the softness of the sex. It should be gentle, it should be even playful, to please. There is a lady here whom I wish you to see, as the shortest way of explaining to you all I mean, she is the most pleasing woman I ever beheld. Independently of her being one of the handsomest, her manner is irresistible. She has all the smiling graces of France, all the blushing delicacy and native softness of England. Nothing can be more delicate, my dear Temple, than the manner in which you offer me your estate in Rutland, by way of anticipating your intended legacy. It is, however, impossible for me to accept it. My father, who saw me naturally more profuse than became my expectations, took such pains to counterwork it by inspiring me with the love of independence, that I cannot have such an obligation even to you. Besides, your legacy is left on the supposition that you are not to marry, and I am absolutely determined you shall, so that, by accepting this mark of your esteem, I should be robbing your younger children. I have not a wish to be richer whilst I am a bachelor, and the only woman I ever wish to marry, the only one my heart desires, would be in three weeks the wife of another. I shall spend less than my income here. Shall I not then be rich? To make you easy, now, I have four thousand pounds in the funds, and that, from the equality of living here, an ensign is obliged to spend near as much as I am. He's inevitably ruined, but I save more money. I pity you, my friend. I am hurt to hear you talk of happiness in the life you at present lead, of finding pleasure in possessing venal beauty. You are in danger of acquiring a habit which will vitiate your taste, and exclude you from that state of refined and tender friendship for which nature formed a heart like yours, and which is only to be found in marriage. I need not add, in a marriage of choice. It has been said that love marriages are generally unhappy. Nothing is more false. Marriages of mere inclination will always be so. Passion alone being concerned, when that is gratified, all tenderness ceases, of course. But love, the gay child of sympathy and esteem, is, when intended by delicacy, the only happiness worth a reasonable man's pursuit, and the choicest gift of heaven. It is a softer, tenderer friendship, enlivened by taste, and by the most ardent desire of pleasing, which time, instead of destroying, will render every hour more dear and interesting. If, as you possibly will, you should call me romantic, hear a man of pleasure on the subject, the Petronius of the last age, the elegant but voluptuous Saint Evremond, who speaks in the following manner of the friendship between married persons. I believe it is this pleasing intercourse of tenderness, this reciprocation of esteem, or, if you will, this mutual ardour of preventing each other in every endearing mark of affection, in which consists the sweetness of this second species of friendship. I do not speak of other pleasures, which are not so much in themselves as in the assurance they give of the entire possession of those we love. This appears to me so true that I am not afraid to assert the man who is by any other means certainly assured of the tenderness of her he loves may easily support the privation of those pleasures, and that they ought not to enter into the account of friendship but as proof that it is without reserve. Tis true, few men are capable of the purity of these sentiments, and tis for that reason we so very seldom see perfect friendship in marriage, at least for any long time. The object which a sensual passion has in view cannot long sustain a commerce so noble as that of friendship. You see, the temples you so much boast are the least of those which true tenderness has to give, and this in the opinion of a voluptuary. 
my dear temple all you have ever known of love is nothing to that sweet consent of souls in unison that harmony of minds congenial to each other of which you have not yet an idea you have seen beauty and it has inspired a momentary emotion but you have never yet had a real attachment you yet know nothing of that irresistible tenderness that delirium of the soul which whilst it refines adds strength to passion i perhaps say too much but i wish with ardour to see you happy in which there is the more merit as i have not the least prospect of being so myself i wish you to pursue the plan of life which i myself think most likely to bring happiness because i know our souls to be of the same frame we have taken different roads but you will come back to mine awake to delicate pleasures i have no taste for any other there are no other for sensible minds my gallantries have been few rather if it is allowed to speak thus of one's self even to a friend from elegance of taste than severity of manners i have loved seldom because i cannot love without esteem believe me jack the mere pleasure of loving even without a return is superior to all the joys of sense where the heart is untouched the french poet does not exaggerate when he says amour tous les autres plaisirs ne valent pas de pain you would perhaps call me mad i am just come from a woman who is capable of making all mankind so adieu yours ed rivers letter twenty two to miss rivers clare street sillery september twenty five i have been rambling about amongst the peasants and asking them a thousand questions in order to satisfy your inquisitive friend as to my father though properly speaking your questions are addressed to him yet being upon duty he begs that for this time you will accept of an answer from me the canadians live a good deal like the ancient patriarchs the lands were originally settled by the troops every officer became a seigneur or lord of the manor every soldier took lands under his commander but as avarice is natural to mankind the soldiers took a great deal more than they could cultivate by way of providing for a family which is the reason so much land is now waste in the finest part of the province those who had children and in general they have a great number portioned out their lands amongst them as they married and lived in the midst of a little world of their descendants there are whole villages and there is even a large island that of coudre where the inhabitants are all the descendants of one pair if we only suppose that their sons went to the next village for wives for i find no tradition of their having had a dispensation to marry their sisters the corn here is very good though not equal to ours the harvest not half so gay as in england and for this reason that the lazy creatures leave the greatest part of their land uncultivated only sowing as much corn of different sorts as will serve themselves and being too proud and too idle to work for hire every family gets in its own harvest which prevents all that jovial spirit which we find when the reapers work together in large parties idleness is the reigning passion here from the peasant to his lord the gentlemen never either ride on horseback or walk but are driven about like women for they never drive themselves lolling at their ease in a calash the peasants i mean the masters of families are pretty near as useless as their lords you will scarce believe me when i tell you that i have seen at the farm next us two children a very beautiful boy and girl of about eleven years old assisted by their grandmother reaping a field of oats whilst the lazy father a strong fellow of thirty-two lay on the grass smoking his pipe about twenty yards from them the old people and children work here those in the age of strength and health only take their pleasure apropos to smoking tis common to see here boys of three years old sitting at their doors smoking their pipes as grave and composed as little old chinese men on a chimney you ask me after our fruits we have as i am told an immensity of cranberries all the year when the snow melts away in spring they are said to be found under it as fresh and as good as in autumn strawberries and raspberries grow wild in profusion you cannot walk a step in the fields without treading on the former great plenty of currants plums apples and pears a few cherries and grapes but not in much perfection excellent muskmelons and watermelons in abundance but not so good in proportion as the musk not a peach nor anything of the kind this i am however convinced is less the fault of the climate than of the people who are too indolent to take pains for anything more than is absolutely necessary to their existence they might have any fruit here but gooseberries for which the summer is too hot there are bushes in the woods and some have been brought from england 
but the fruit falls off before it is ripe. The wild fruits here, especially those of the bramble kind, are in much greater variety and perfection than in England. When I speak of the natural productions of the country, I should not forget that hemp and hops grow everywhere in the woods. I should imagine the former might be cultivated here with great success if the people could be persuaded to cultivate anything. A little corn of every kind, a little hay, a little tobacco, half a dozen apple trees, a few onions and cabbages, make the whole of a Canadian plantation. There is scarce a flower, except those in the woods, where there is a variety of the most beautiful shrubs I ever saw. The wild cherry, of which the woods are full, is equally charming, in flower and in fruit, and, in my opinion, at least equals the arbutus. They sow their wheat in spring, never manure the ground, and plough it in the slightest manner. Can it then be wondered at, that it is inferior to ours? They fancy the frost would destroy it, if sown in autumn. But this is all prejudice, as experience has shown. I myself saw a field of wheat this year at the governor's farm, which was manured, and sown in autumn, as fine as I ever saw in England. I should tell you, they are so indolent as never to manure their lands, or even their gardens, and that, till the English came, all the manure of Quebec was thrown into the river. You will judge how naturally rich the soil must be, to produce good crops without manure, and without ever lying fallow, and almost without ploughing. Yet our political writers in England never speak of Canada without the epithet of barren. They tell me this extreme fertility is owing to the snow, which lies five or six months on the ground. Provisions are dear, which is owing to the prodigious number of horses kept here, every family having a carriage, even the poorest peasant, and every son of that peasant keeping a horse for his little excursions of pleasure, besides those necessary for the business of the farm. The war also destroyed the breed of cattle, which I am told, however, begins to increase. They have even so far improved in corn, as to export some this year to Italy and Spain. Don't you think I am become an excellent farmeress? Tis intuition. Some people are born learned. I am not at all astonishment at my knowledge. I never was so vain of a letter in my life. Shall I own the truth? I had most of my intelligence from old John, who lived long with my grandfather in the country, and who, having little else to do here, has taken some pains to pick up a competent knowledge of the state of agriculture five miles round Quebec. Adieu, I am tired of the subject. Your faithful, A. Furmore. Now I think of it, why did you not write to your brother? Did you choose me to expose my ignorance? If so, I flatter myself you are a little taken in, for I think John and I figure in the rural way. Letter 23 To Miss Rivers, Clare Street, Sillery, September 29, 10 o'clock. Oh, to be sure, we are vastly to be pitied. No bows at all with the general, only about six to one, a very pretty proportion, and what I hope always to see. We, the ladies, I mean, drink chocolate with the general to-morrow, and he gives us a ball on Thursday. You would not know Quebec again, nothing but smiling faces now, all so gay as never was, the sweetest country in the world. Never expect to see me in England again. One is really somebody here. I have been asked to dance by only twenty-seven. On the subject of dancing, I am, as it were, a little embarrassed. You are pleased to observe that in the time of scarcity, when all the men were at Montreal, I suffered a foolish little captain to sigh and say civil things to me, pour passer le temps, and the creature takes the airs of a lover, to which he has not the least pretensions, and chooses to be angry that I won't dance with him on Thursday, and I positively won't. It is really pretty enough that every absurd animal, who takes upon him to make love to one, is to fancy himself entitled to a return. I have no patience with the men's ridiculousness. Have you, Lucy? But I see a ship coming down under full sail. It may be Emily and her friends. The colours are all out. They slacken sail. They drop anchor opposite the house. Tis certainly them. I must fly to the beach. Music, as I am a person. And an awning on the deck. The boat puts off with your brother in it. Adieu for a moment. I must go and invite them on shore. Two o'clock. "'Twas Emily and Mrs. Melmoth, with two or three very pretty French women. Your brother is a happy man. I found tea and coffee under the awning, and a table loaded with Montreal fruit, which is vastly better than ours. By the way, the Colonel has brought me an immensity. He's so gallant and all that. We regaled ourselves, and landed. They dine here, and we dance in the evening. We are to have a syllabub in the wood. My father has sent for Sir George and Major Melmoth, and a half a dozen of the most agreeable men from Quebec.' 
he is enchanted with his little emily he loved her when she was a child i cannot tell you how happy i am my emily is handsomer than ever you know how partial i am to beauty i never had a friendship for an ugly woman in my life adieu mon très cher yours a fermor your brother looks like an angel this morning he is not dressed he is not undressed but somehow easy elegant and enchanting he has no powder and his hair a little dégagé blown about by the wind and agreeably disordered such fire in his countenance his eyes say a thousand agreeable things he is in such spirits as i never saw him not a man of them has the least chance to-day i shall be in love with him if he goes on at this rate not that it will be to any purpose in the world he never would even flirt with me though i have made him a thousand advances my heart is so light lucy i cannot describe it i love emily at my soul tis three years since i saw her and there is something so romantic in finding her in canada there is no saying how happy i am i want only you to be perfectly so three o'clock the messengers returned sir george is gone with a party of french ladies to lake charles emily blushed when the message was delivered he might reasonably suppose they would be here to-day as the wind was fair your brother dances with my sweet friend she loses nothing by the exchange she is however a little piqued at this appearance of disrespect twelve o'clock sir george came just as we sat down to supper he did right he complained first and affected to be angry she had not sent an express from pointe aux trembles he was however gayer than usual and very attentive to his mistress your brother seemed chagrined at his arrival emily perceived it and redoubled her politeness to him which in a little time restored part of his good humour upon the whole it was an agreeable evening but it would have been more so if sir george had come at first or not at all the ladies lie here and we all go together in the morning to quebec the gentlemen are going i steal a moment to seal and give this to the colonel who will put it in his packet to-morrow letter twenty four to miss rivers clarges street quebec september thirtieth would you believe it possible my dear that sir george should decline attending emily montague from montreal and leave the pleasing commission to me i am obliged to him for the three happiest days of my life yet am piqued at his choosing me for his cecispeo to his mistress he seems to think me a man sans consequence with whom a lady may safely be trusted there is nothing very flattering in such a kind of confidence let him take care of himself if he is impertinent and sets me at defiance i am not vain but set our fortunes aside and i dare enter the list with sir george clayton i cannot give her a coach and six but i can give her what is more conducive to happiness a heart which knows how to value her perfections i never had so pleasing a journey we were three days coming down because we made it a continual party of pleasure took music with us landed once or twice a day visited the french families we knew lay both nights on shore and danced at the seigneurs of the village this river from montreal to quebec exhibits a scene perhaps not to be matched in the world it is settled on both sides though the settlements are not so numerous on the south shore as on the other the lovely confusion of woods mountains meadows cornfields rivers for there are several on both sides which lose themselves into the st lawrence intermixed with churches and houses breaking upon you at a distance through the trees form a variety of landscapes to which it is difficult to do justice this charming scene with a clear serene sky a gentle breeze in our favour and the conversation of half a dozen fine women would have made the voyage pleasing to the most insensible man on earth my emily too of the party and most politely attentive to the pleasure she saw i had in making the voyage agreeable to her i every day love her more and without considering the impropriety of it i cannot help giving way to an inclination in which i find such exquisite pleasure i find a thousand charms and the least trifle i can do to oblige her don't reason with me on this subject i know it is madness to continue to see her but i find a delight in her conversation which i cannot prevail on myself to give up till she is actually married i respect her engagements and pretend to know more from her than friendship but as to myself will love her in whatever manner i please to shew you my prudence however i intend to dance with the handsomest unmarried frenchwoman here on thursday and to show her an attention which shall destroy all suspicion of my tenderness for emily i am jealous of sir george and hate him but i dissemble it better than i thought it possible for me to do my lucy i am not happy my mind is in a state not to be described i am weak enough to encourage a hope for which there is not the least foundation i misconstrue her friendship for me every moment and that attention which is merely gratitude for my apparent anxiety to oblige i even fancy her eyes understand mine which i am afraid speak too plainly the sentiments of my heart i love her my dear girl to madness these three days 
I'm interrupted. Adieu. Yours, Ed Rivers. Tis Captain Firmer, who insists on my dining at Celery. They will eternally throw me in the way of this lovely woman. Of what materials do they suppose me formed? End of Letters 19 through 24